in many different ways in the upcoming lectures, there's this fundamental <laughs> tension between marginal and average cost. Because the price relevant to whether the thing should be created in the first place is some average cost. The price relevant to what the thing should be sold at is marginal cost. And we sort of can't get both of those things at the same time. And so we have sort of these two different things that have two different relevant prices, which different regimes do better at capturing each of, but we sort of can't get both. And that's sort of the fundamental problem that we face when we have these declining marginal cost industries. Um, Okay, so to address some of these concerns in practice, what's used more often is average cost pricing. And by the way, we have midterm, we're going to do another eval here, so people can either grab it after or whenever and pencil those out and uh, give them to Michael and we'll turn them in at the end. Um, so to, so to address some of these concerns, um, it's more common that, that average rather than marginal cost pricing is used. This is often called rate of return or cost plus regulation because the utility is capped not literally to earn its average cost, but average cost plus some small profit, because that's thought to uh, be necessary to incentivize people to invest in that industry. So it's basically costs, including the cost of capital. And this is meant to cover the natural return on the capital investment. Um, a simple model of this would be to just cap prices at average cost. And um, we're going to talk about some of the cost that this has relative to marginal cost pricing. In fact, that'll be our main focus. But uh, Matt, could you explain uh, what some of the benefits of average cost pricing might be over marginal cost pricing? Uh, well, you mentioned that with um, you might have to provide a subsidy for marginal cost pricing, so you don't have to do that if you price That's a good point, cost. yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think that's an important uh, benefit. It helps politically and, and with some other issues. It's also often easier to measure a firm's average cost than it is to measure their marginal cost. So marginal cost, you really need to say, if you were to increase one unit, you know, what would happen? Whereas average cost is just, if you can somehow account for all the costs that you've expended, that's enough, right? So that's much easier to figure out by auditing, whereas marginal cost requires much more careful understanding of exactly what you need in order to produce one more unit. Um, you also only need to know the average cost at a single point. You don't need to know what it looks like all along the demand, all along the cost curve. And um, <coughs> if consumers are willing to purchase the product at the average cost, enough to make, you know, a, if you can raise a total amount of revenue that's equal to average cost, well, then you know that the product was worth creating in the first place, right? Because the consumer is earning some surplus. So average cost pricing can lessen a lot of these informational concerns that we had. Um, so average cost regulation is pretty common throughout the economy. And uh, Shen, yes. could you give just some examples of average cost regulation? Um. Or cost rate of return regulation? What's, a, what's an example of that in the real world? Usually transportation is not run that way. So some transportation things are. Probably the most common are the power, water, <coughs> heat utilities. They're all run, there's some regulatory board that basically oversees them and makes sure that they lower their prices if they start making too much profits. And, um, these boards, in turn, are overseen, and there's a question of how well they're overseen, but they're overseen by consumer uh, boards. Public transit does have some of this. Some infrastructure, like bridges, are <coughs> required to recoup their average costs. So that's why sometimes they charge quite a bit for the roads, even if it doesn't cost that much to maintain them. Uh, telecommunications used to be regulated this way. So until the 1980s, basically AT&T wasn't allowed to make more than a very small profit. Um, and it was actually a bit odd. What happened is that um, local loop services, prices were held down, and a lot was charged for long distance. So I don't know if you guys are probably too young to remember. I'm almost too young to remember. But it used to be that long distance was just like massively more expensive than local calls. And, and that was because local calls were actually being subsidized by the um, higher prices on the national calls, 
and all of that was sort of held below a certain rate of profit. However, in the 1980s, the antitrust uh, division of the Justice Department brought a suit and got AT&T broken up and forced them to give access to the local loops to other competitors. And so now there's competition, except I don't know if anyone's been noticing that there's not actually that much competition anymore. So we, the industry sort of consolidated down to like, uh, you know, Verizon having like a 50% market share, AT&T having like a 30% market share, T-Mobile having like a 15% market share, Sprint having like 10%, and then there's a bunch of like small guys. And now AT&T wants to buy T-Mobile. So we may be heading back to that monopolistic market structure, which might be because these guys are, you know, evil and trying to monopolize, or it might be because it really is a natural monopoly and it was a mistake to break them up. So there's controversy over that. Um, so uh, <coughs> other examples uh, which are broader is some countries actually do this through the uh, uh, legal system. So in many countries you can bring a lawsuit against a company if they're abusively pricing or if they're pricing too much or making an excess of profit. This is true in Peru and that's sort of a, effectively a way of doing average cost pricing through the legal system. Okay. So average cost pricing um, is pretty simple when there's just one price that you charge. But you know, what if there's price discrimination, right? Should we um, disallow or allow firms to price discriminate? Well, the key question there is whether that increases or decreases social surplus, which is what we were talking about a week ago, right? Um, but there's an even more subtle question. We might even be willing to allow it to reduce surplus by a little bit if it raises the profits of the firm. Because if it raises their profits, that means we can lower prices elsewhere, right? This is one reason why they let them charge so much on long distance so that they could subsidize the local loop, right? And so the, the usual answer is that price discrimination either just increases surplus or it increases profits enough without decreasing surplus too much. And so most of the time, regulated utilities do a ton of price discrimination. So like power, heat, and gas are just enormously discriminatory across different parts of the city. And it's really easy, but it's incredibly hard for you to go get gas from somebody else in another part of the city if they're getting it at a lower rate. So that makes arbitrage very hard. So a lot of these services are highly discriminatory uh, across districts, across incomes, across amounts that you purchase. They have some of the most sophisticated methods of price discrimination. And in fact, a lot of the modern theory of price discrimination, including that problem that I gave you, the second problem on the exam, which uh, was, I guess, the bane of everybody's existence, uh, was based on a, a report that was commissioned by the California uh, Regulatory Board about how they could do better price discrimination. Um, so, Multi-product pricing is another issue. So when you have a lot of different products, like the local service or the um, long distance service, the ideal solution is to use what's called Ramsey pricing, which is basically just third degree price discrimination. What you do is you charge higher prices on the things that are more inelastic, lower prices on the things that are more elastic, and you recoup costs that way. That achieves the minimum distortion for a given amount of profit that you need to raise. In practice, however, things look almost the opposite of that. So national service, long distance service was highly elastic, actually. People have lots of alternatives to making a long distance phone call. Local service is highly inelastic, it turns out. And yet we had opposite pricing because people thought that there was some sort of redistributive issue. Like the people who have to make a lot of long distance calls are sort of rich, and so we should charge them a lot. And there's sort of a broader question that this raises, which is, you know, we've been doing all this analysis of consumer surplus. We've been treating every consumer exactly the same. And then we did this stuff on redistribution, where we, it was all about getting money from one person to the other. So, you know, a key question is, does it make sense for us, when thinking about consumer surplus, to treat every consumer the same? And we're not going to get into anything other than that, but it's something to just reflect on. Okay. So, um... Average cost pricing can also arise 
not just from an explicit government regulation, but also by sort of the natural operation of the market. So if anyone can come into an industry, we have free entry in the sense we talked about earlier on in the course, um, and remember what the conditions for that were, it were that there had to be a large number of equally able people who could manage a firm. They must have easy access to capital, and entering the firm doesn't require any special knowledge or thing that is really difficult to acquire. It, it can't be rocket science, and there can't be any explicit government barriers to entry. In those cases, any time a firm is making a profit, they're going to attract someone else to enter. And that will drive down the prices to the point where they're equal to average cost when there's no profit being made, right? That's what we talked about several weeks ago. And that basically leads to average cost pricing. So we can think of average cost pricing either as sort of a government method of regulation or as sort of something that naturally comes out of the market process. Yeah, David? In this case, would there still be like a small amount of profit as a, a payment to the investors for their capital? Yeah, it would be sort of similar to rate of return regulation, right? Yeah. Um, so this uh, arises in equilibrium without re regulation, and in fact this is a very common assumption in a wide range of economic models. Um, there's lots of reasons to think that it's actually pretty realistic, unrealistic because of some of these heterogeneity issues that I emphasized a lot in lecture five, but it often offers a useful benchmark and way of, of looking at things. And so in many cases, competition to get into an industry can mimic average cost pricing. Um, some, and I think this is a little bit of a crazy claim, but some have even claimed that without multiple firms trying to get into the industry, uh, there can still be average cost pricing. Because any time a firm makes a profit, even if no other firm actually comes into the industry, the firm is so afraid of someone else coming in that they hold their prices down near the point where they're hardly making any profits so as not to attract anyone else in. Um, this is called limit pricing, and this theory is called the theory of contestable markets or contestability. Um, this is a bit strange because it basically requires that the firm is so afraid of a competitor um, that they think that the competitor could sort of like come in, grab their monopoly position, and make all the profits that the monopoly was making without being forced to face the competition from you, right? Because if you have a second competitor coming in, there's, it's almost sure that he's not going to make as much profits as you were making if you're now competing against him, right? Yeah, David. But if they, I mean, if they push their costs down to average costs anyway, they're not doing any worse than they would like with the new entry. So. Well, but the point is, you know if they had prices a bit above, the, point, the argument is that they would be scared to put their prices any above uh -huh. the average cost uh -huh. because then they'd attract someone else in. And that's a bit implausible because like once that other guy gets in, he's still competing with you who is still in the market, right? And so it doesn't really seem like you would make as much profits as you'd make. Yeah, I mean, it seems really? like in both situations, if you push your cost down to average cost to like deter an entry, that's true. You're doing, you're in the same situation as if the entry actually came in and pushed your cost. That's down another average. good point. Yeah. So you, why would you ever want to do that? I mean, it, it's not very. Well, yeah. In a natural monopoly, um, yeah. If another competitor is the market, it pushes up the average cost. Uh, it will cost for everybody. Yeah, that's another, that's another problem in these types of markets, right? Is that in some sense that's not, well, the idea of congestible markets is the other guy will undercut you, take all the business away from you, he'll be more efficient, and he'll gain the profit. But again, that's a pretty weird assumption to think would happen as well, right? Um, so also, this really assumes that there's no fixed cost of entry or exit, which is often implausible. And so I think, in general, this sort of contestability argument is implausible. However, to some extent, these may put limits on the profits that even a monopolist, unregulated, can earn. It's not that if they earn any profit, someone's going to come in, but they may be afraid of entry, and that may help, help hold down their profits. Um, especially when there are many people who could potentially enter, and entry is quick, easy and easy to reverse. So if the new company comes in and it doesn't make very much profits, it has to be able to get out, right? Because otherwise it won't have an incentive to come in in the first place, right? So I think one answer